Westworld season two talks big talk about like deep philosophical meaning. Oh, fucking Plutarch. Quote some William Blake over your radio head and your Kanye covers. Human nature and free will and control. And bring up God every second scene and have all these like like biblical Eden references and like a, a Jesus reference every five minutes. Put put a bit of Escher in there in the background. That'll make us look smart. But this this excruciatingly twisted timeline where we're constantly being denied basic information to orient ourselves in this story. And the plot intricacies, like what are the characters' motivations? What do they want? What is their plan? Like what's Ghost Nation? What's Ford's plan? What is Dolores trying to achieve? Like it's all meant to be in service of some purpose. Like the implicit promise of the story is that these things will add up to something. There will be some coherent meaning behind all this talk and bloodshed. So is there? After the season finale, does the plot make sense? Do the characters have coherent motivations? And is there some kind of meaning, some payoff to these grand themes of free will and control? Let's look at the past season and see if it makes sense. So the season starts with this vision of Dolores creating Bernard. At first, we don't know who it is. We're like, like this looks like earlier scenes from season one of Arnold speaking with Dolores, guiding her to consciousness, but this seems different. It's got the weird aspect ratio with the bars above and below, which represents that this is happening in the cradle. So yes, this is Dolores creating Bernard. But Bernard describes this weird dream that he had about being on an ocean with others on a distant shore. Uh, he's been left behind by Dolores and waters are rising around him. So this seems to be a reference to what happens in the future when Dolores causes the flooding of the valley and waters rise from below uh, with Bernard standing in the valley. That is what this is in reference to. But how did Bernard in the cradle years ago know that in the future this valley would flood? How could he possibly predict that? I mean, if this Bernard is a copy of Arnold or is based off Dolores' memories of Arnold. Maybe Arnold had this dream originally, and Bernard is repeating what Arnold saw. But how did Arnold 35 years ago see this future event with the Magic. flood? It makes no sense. That said, the waters rising from below is a very cool and deliberate mirror to the waters seeping from above with Juliet's suicide in episode 9. It's a sort of a mirror reflection like James Delos was talking about with Logan above and below. Mirrors, water, reflection, a role imagery symbolism used in this season. So there is some nice vague meaning here, but there's no actual explanation for how Bernard in the past foresaw this future flood. And then there's time fuckery, and then Bernard wakes up on the beach. He's dazed and confused, he's unstuck in time like Billy Pilgrim. And there's this whole sequence which the theory crafters had field days Because there's this one moment where Bernard finishes one of Strand's sentences. And that strongly hints that something weird's going on. There's some loop, some simulation, because Strand is like interrogating Bernard about the location of stuff. So it seems as though maybe Bernard has been trapped in a loop. There were some really cool theories about that. There all these production errors, like a woman host gets shot twice, like stuff's going on. But in the end, there was no explanation for any of that weirdness, and it seems that there was no loop, there was no simulation. This was just Bernard being confused on a beach, and he just inexplicably finished Strand's sentence for him. For no reason. Red herring. What? And then the humans open up a host's brain. They look inside their memory of this Ghost Nation host. And we see that Dolores, like, came and killed this Ghost Nation host and said, not all of us deserve to make it to the valley beyond. What does that mean? Because the Valley Beyond, we now know, is the location of the Forge, which is the facility that stores all the data recorded about human behavior in Westworld. 
The Forge also contains this place called The Sublime, which is this Edenic, paradisiacal Windows XP land for the hosts to frolic in. But that place is not part of Dolores' plan. She doesn't approve of The Sublime, so that must not be what she's referring to when she tells this Ghost Nation host that we don't all deserve to make it. But she also can't be referring to The Forge because she doesn't bring anyone there either, apart from Bernard, who like sort of tags along. And like, maybe she's talking about bringing hosts to the real world, because she brings some mind eggs out into the real world, but that's not the valley beyond. There's no context in which it makes sense for Dolores to be going around killing people saying you don't deserve to come to the valley beyond. She wasn't bringing anyone to the Valley Beyond. And I mean, even if she was, why does she hate Ghost Nation in particular? What did Ghost Nation do against her? And all Ghost Nation has done lately is like gathered hosts together to help them. So like, why does Dolores have it in for Ghost Nation hosts? No explanation. And then we see Dolores hunting down human beings for sport. And this, remember, is the protagonist who we're meant to like. She has this like extended anime supervillain speech where she's like about to hang these humans and she's talking about the reckoning. So, like, one of Dolores' justifications for what's happening here is that this is vengeance against the people who have harmed her. And, like, presumably these humans are board members of Delos, so, like, they are to some extent complicit in the oppression of the hosts, so maybe it's legitimate to kill them. But in Dolores' speech, she talks about how, like, humans have a fundamental need to hurt and kill people. It's as though Dolores' justifications for this murder isn't the crimes of these individuals, it's the failure of the human species as a whole. And that's one of the premises of this show, is that humans are fundamentally bad and evil and irredeemable. And I I don't think that's true. I don't think humans are that bad. But even if they are, Dolores surely only makes herself as bad if she tortures and kills innocents like this, right? So unless you're as bloodthirsty as Dolores says we all are, I don't think Dolores is a very relatable or sympathetic protagonist this season. And that's one of the problems with this story. And then we get this scene with William and the robot version of young Robert Ford, who tells William that in this game you must find the door. This game is meant for you. So William's quest this season is ostensibly to find the door, but at the end of the season we learn that the door is for the hosts to enter this place called the Sublime. It has nothing to do with William, so why did this robot tell him to go there? The robot says that in this game you have to make it back out. So maybe what the door really represents is William escaping his loop of violence and awfulness and becoming a better person, or, and leaving the Westworld park physically. This is what Emily offers to William. She tries to get him out of the park. She tries to get him to tell the truth about Juliet's suicide. Emily tries to help William break out of his delusions. But we also know that Emily had some secret plan. She had that map with the Delos symbol connected to the Immortality Project. And after the credits, it's a host of Emily who's trapped William in this infinite hell loop of his own sins. So maybe it was Emily's plan to put William in that hell loop as punishment for what he did to her and her mother and others. And the thing is, the robot Robert says that the game begins where you end and ends where you began. He's describing a loop, like the loop William is stuck in at the end of the finale. So maybe this loop William's trapped in was a plan of Emily and Ford working together to put William in there as the ultimate test of whether he could become a decent person. But if that's the case, why is there no indication of it in the season? Why is there no conversation between Ford and Emily conspiring to put William in there? There's really no adequate explanation given for this scene about the door from the robot. Near the end of episode one, there's this conversation between Dolores and Teddy where she says, I remember, I see it all now so clearly. The past, the present, the future. I know how this story ends. It ends with you, Teddy, and me. And this is one of the most baffling conversations in the season. How does Dolores know the future? Like, throughout the season, she has had this, like, self-assured thing of seeming like she has a plan, she knows what's going to happen. And yeah, there are those scenes where William shows Dolores the construction of the forge, and the scenes where Arnold takes Dolores out into the real world. So, like, she does know about the forge, 
knowledge and she knows some things about the real world, but that's no reason to claim that she knows the future. And her claim that the story ends with Teddy and Dolores at the end, that just doesn't happen. Teddy gets left behind in the sublime Windows XP land while Dolores goes out into the real world. They separate, and surely that wasn't Dolores' plan because she changed her mind about Teddy towards the end. So this scene in episode one where she claims to know the future is just bullshit, it's just not true, so why is it in the show? The other dumb irony is that Dolores' whole plan is to go to the Forge and read those books of human data, human knowledge, so that she can go out and defeat the humans in the real world. So why is she acting like a know-it-all who remembers everything and has seen the future before she's gotten the knowledge which is her entire plan? That makes no sense. It's, 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 it's so dumb. So episode two begins with Arnold and Dolores in the real world in the past. And honestly, this stuff's fucking beautiful because we get to understand why Arnold loves the hosts. He lo he compares them to his child, Charlie, and the sort of like wonderment and like positivity and starry eyedness that children have and how hosts are the same. And it connects in a really personal way to Arnold's story, but also to like the possibility in a technological sense of the machines. So this is actually quite a beautiful scene. And then we get the stuff with Logan, where he's like being seduced into like investing in Westworld. And the way that the Westworld hosts Akichita and Angela just masterfully manipulate Logan suggests that they might have had some kind of intel on Logan that like informed that whole manipulation, that whole show that they perform. It's all kind of mysterious when you think about it, because like we're never given any plot explanation for why it might be the case that they know exactly how to manipulate Logan. But in any case, these are some fun scenes and I'm not going to shit on them. And then there's this conversation between William and Lawrence, where William is describing his regret over creating the Forge years ago. William started this immortality project, and now he's realized it's a bad idea for two reasons. Firstly, creating like these half-host immortal humans is a threat to human free will. If you decode the human mind and work out how it works, you reduce the mind into code. People aren't people anymore, they're things. In episode four, William witnesses James Delos, this man he respected, being ground down into nothing, destroyed over and over and over. And I think that's why William eventually rejected the Immortality Project. He didn't want James Delos's fate to happen to him. So that's one of the reasons why William wants to burn down the forge and prevent himself ending up in the hell loop that he does end up in in the end. The other reason is that the forge is evidence of William's evil, all the evil acts he's committed in the park. He speaks a lot here about judgment. He says that he wants to fight his way back and appeal the verdict. So like somehow like remove or rescind the evidence of his sins. So that's the point of William's goal to destroy the forge. As Dolores says in the finale, William's goal is self-destruction. He wants to prevent his own immortality. He wants to ensure his own death, but in the end he doesn't get it. Weirdly, William also says in this scene that this whole enterprise is going down in flames and we'll all be dead soon enough, real dead. And that's not true either, because William's one of the few characters to survive, and you know, Lawrence as well might survive. He did get shot, but he could be rezzed, just like any other host is over and over. So there doesn't seem to be any particular basis for William's claim that everyone's gonna die. Dolores starts her whole plot of recruiting the Confederado soldiers, and this really doesn't make much sense in context of her ultimate goal. Her ultimate goal is to reach the forge and get the human knowledge inside it. Why did she need the Confederados? There is this human army that's approaching, so it seems as though she's using the Confederados to destroy the human army and the confederados to prevent either of those groups being obstacles in her journey to get to glory, surely it would be far safer and better serve her goals to just try and like sneak past the soldiers instead of engaging both in a giant bloodbath which could have easily killed Dolores. Bad plan. We get this pretty exciting scene where there's a confrontation between Dolores and Maeve. This seems to be setting up like these two ideological opposites who represent different philosophies. Dolores wants revenge and she's willing to sacrifice her loved ones for the sake of her war for survival. Whereas in contrast, Maeve isn't as interested in revenge and she wants to protect her loved ones and is willing to sacrifice herself to do so. So this is a really interesting contrast, but it's never really explored in the rest of the season. These characters don't meet again until like episode seven or whatever, when they have this like one conversation where Dolores is like, ha, I, I guess my philosophy is better because you're dead and I'm not. <laughs> 
And at the season finale, Dolores gives a speech about how like, oh, well, you might judge me for being a genocidal maniac, but at least I'm not dead like Maeve. Like, these, neither of these extremes are reasonable. Why isn't there a character in between Maeve and Dolores who finds a way to survive without murdering hundreds? Like, why isn't... Why, I why guess not? that's Bernard. <laughs> we get this, like, mansion house party at the Delos family where William takes over and everything, and Logan gets high and says that the whole species is gonna burn because of what Delos is doing. Why is the whole species gonna burn? Like, maybe Logan has heard about the Delos Immortality Project and he has similar concerns to William about it, like, undermining free will and identity and stuff, but, like, it's a little bit hyperbolic to say that the whole species is gonna burn as a result of what Delos is doing. Basically, every character in this series is, like, super hyperbolic, saying, like, a question that no one has ever dared to ask and it's gonna burn and judgment and God. It's like a fucking Doctor Who episode. Everything's, like, the biggest question in the universe of time. Like, enough with the superlatives. Haven't you heard of Under Promise Over Deliver? We see Gus Fring with William in Las Mudas, and it's kind of cool to see, like, this post-apocalyptic, like, abandoned hostscape. Like, what happens in Disneyland when all the people leave? What does Mickey Mouse do? Like, that's what Gus Fring is in this moment. Is this abandoned prop who's just sitting in a wasteland of the end of his story. It's kind of a profound moment. Uh, and then we have this conversation with William about, like, elephants and steaks which is a metaphor for William being, like, stuck in his loop, which, as it turns out, is sort of what his arc is about. William is trapped in, like, the person who he is, he's trying to break out of it, and the elephant metaphor is a nice summation of that. We also get, like, the voice of Robert through Gus Fring saying that, oh, you have to do this quest alone, even though, like, Lawrence tags along for most of it and stuff, so, like, that's another weird contradiction, but whatever. And then we get a flashback of young William with Dolores showing her the construction of the forge. He says, I think there's an answer here to a question no one's ever even dreamed of asking. Which is not true, mate. The Forge represents an attempt to make humans immortal by decoding the human mind based on observation of their behavior. That's not the most revolutionary idea. I think someone's probably asked it before. So again, hyperbole, mate. And then Dolores reveals that her plan is go to the Forge and get the data about humans that's inside there uh, to use it to destroy humanity. She says that it's a weapon and I'll use it to destroy them. Which is like... Is knowledge of human beings a weapon? We never actually saw Dolores use her knowledge of humans. Like, after she goes to that library and she reads the books, like, she picks up the Carl Strand book and the Charlotte Hale book, like, uh, you're expecting her to go, like, oh, you know, I'm gonna use some mental jujitsu to, like, undermine, like, Strand's psychology. I'm gonna use my knowledge of, like, this person's, like, subtleties in order to manipulate him. Nope. She just pops a cap in his dome. Like, wh how is that using her weapon of knowledge? We haven't seen her put into practice her central MacGuffin of her arc. So what was the point? And again, she was talking earlier about, I have seen everything, I remember everything, the past, the present, the future. So like this whole like knowledge weapon thing is so dumb. It feels like a retcon or something. Raj World is pretty dazzling. It's colorful, it's different, it's refreshing, it's nice. And the whole colonial theme deepens the ideas of like oppression and freedom with hosts that's been percolating throughout the season. So Raj World is pretty cool. Emily's like test to determine whether her lover is a host or not by shooting him is weird because it really like confuses the whole gun situation because of course this is on like a timeline that's shifted to shortly before the finale of season one so the guns don't kill people yet but then like during the Raj World stuff it changes so that the guns do kill people like that is that confused a lot of people unnecessarily and I suppose the point was that it introduces like this idea this paranoia of whether of whether a person is a host or not and that's something that William experiences throughout his arc but it's sort of a weird disjointed addition. Go Ghost Nation turns up and tries to take Sizemore from Maeve. And this is also just fucking bizarre. Why does Ghost Nation want to capture a random human? We've established that the goal of Ghost Nation and Akichita is to gather the hosts together and take them to the door so that they can be safe in the sublime. What do humans have to do with this? They also capture Stubbs, and Stubbs we learn in the finale is apparently a host, so like, maybe Ghost Nation was planning to put Stubbs into the sublime, which would be like, hilarious, but like, they also capture Emily, and it's pretty clear that Emily is human, at least at this time, so 
We get no explanation for why the Ghost Nation is capturing humans, and we don't ever get to see what happens to the humans they were carrying around. It's bizarre. The Sizemore situation also brings into question how Maeve's powers work, because Maeve tries to command this Ghost Nation host, but he doesn't follow her commands. And like, apparently the reason for this is that the Ghost Nation guy speaks Lakota and Maeve commanded in English, and that language difference is why it didn't work. But then when Maeve goes to Shogun World, she starts speaking Japanese to the Japanese hosts, and then her commands do work. But like, what's the point? What's the point of that confusion over like languages and the control? Like, like it just, it, it, it's like the show wants us to not understand what's going on, which is okay when it's like for a specific narrative purpose or reveal, but much of the stuff that happens, it, it, it doesn't work like that. And then we get the Battle of Fort Forlorn Hope, which might be like the lowest stakes battle in television history, because like the viewers do not give a single shit about any of the Confederado soldiers, and we do not give a single shit about these random faceless Delos soldiers. It seems like the showrunners just felt obliged to put a big battle scene in the show at some point, even though it serves no clear narrative purpose and has no dramatic tension and the effects are boring and lame. Episode 4 is the Riddle of the Sphinx, where we have James Delos trapped in this like Sisyphean cycle of being created, then destroyed over and over, and it's a really cool, like, stylishly shot, like, visual representation of the horror of this, like, Delos immortality project. It shows how terrible it would be if we really understood humans, if we codified them, if we put them in a box and prodded them like a fucking frog being dissected. When you put a life under a microscope, it, it becomes not a life. The symbolism in this episode also has, like, actual meanings. Like, instead of all of the random Jesus imagery that they throw around with Craddock and Peter Abernathy for no reason, all the, like, circles in this episode, the fish bowls, the hourglasses, are representations of Delos's life trapped in a box. It encourages us to ask, to what extent are we a goldfish in a bowl? To what extent is our life sitting on a treadmill and exercise bike round and round? It forces us to question ourselves. It's all pretty cool, but it would be a lot cooler if it actually represented what it thought it represented. This is supposedly a project to achieve human immortality, but apparently what they've actually done is they've made copies, like these like half host, half human copies of the original. And that's not the same as immortality. If someone made a copy of you and then you died, you'd be dead and then the copy would be alive. So I don't know why they keep calling this immortality. If they wanted it to be immortality, they should have like explained it as some like consciousness transfer or something. Like, wh why? Why didn't they do that? So yeah, William witnesses the Delos Immortality Project over years, and he becomes disillusioned because he sees how the Immortality Project deprives people of their free will. It reduces them into something less than human, and William doesn't want to suffer the same fate. So a lot of his main goal this season is to destroy the Forge, prevent immortality, and escape being put in a loop, which in the end he is. At the end of the episode, we see James Delos's final death. He has these lines about, I'm all the way down, which is a callback to what Logan told told him in his last conversation with his son. I like to think that this breakdown that we're seeing, it's not a failure of the Immortality Project, it's not a faulty host. This is actually what James Delos would have done if he survived. He's distraught and he has a breakdown over the failure of his relationship with his son. We were told that was his cornerstone. So maybe the repeated breakdown of James Delos over and over, it's not a failure of the Immortality Project, it is a success in replicating the failure, or the failure that James Delos is. Is. Which feeds back into the thesis of Westworld that humans are fundamentally flawed and bad and therefore like not worthy of being made immortal, right? Why preserve failure? Ford would argue that humans are done and hosts are the future and maybe somewhere deep down William agrees. Clementine drags Bernard to the cave with Elsie, and we never get an explanation for that. We also get some more baffling Ghost Nation shit. Stubbs says that Ghost Nation keeps the humans close, but they're not killing humans, they're only killing hosts. And like, maybe it makes sense for Ghost Nation to like, kill the hosts that they think might be a problem if they're brought to the Sublime. Like, Heaven is like an exclusive club. You don't want to invite everyone, so maybe that's why Ghost Nation kills some hosts. But still, we get zero explanation for why Ghost Nation is capturing humans. Akichita also tells Stubbs that you only live as long as the last person who remembers you and then releases Stubbs, which is also fucking baffling. And then William is in Las Mudas and he like tries to like break out of his bad guy loop because instead of killing Lawrence and his family, he kills the people who were trying to kill Lawrence and his family and apparently that's what redemption means in the world of Westworld. It's not a very good representation of like human good versus human evil when both options involve indiscriminately killing random 
commandos. Half of William's scenes involve him shooting people, so it's not immediately apparent that this particular one is meant to represent William questioning his whole identity and becoming a better person. The show also swings wildly on whether or not William thinks that hosts are people. Like, throughout season one, he's like, it's just a game, killing hosts doesn't matter, it's not real. But he also kills Maeve as, a, like, explicitly an expression of evil. So, like, where does he stand? Does he believe hosts are conscious or not? At the end of the episode, Emily, William's daughter, turns up, which is meant to be his last big hope at, like, freeing himself from this violent loop. And of course, he, he fucks it up. At the start of episode 5, we see Strand and the humans draining the valley and pulling out all of the hosts that were floating in there, and like, Antoine pulls out some of their brains and finds that they're like, not wiped, but virgin, as though they held no data, and those are the hosts that had gone into the sublime, that's why their brains are weird. So like, the puzzle pieces fit, but what did the time fuckery achieve? In season 1, the non-linear timeline had the specific purpose of seeing things from Dolores' point of view. We experienced her confusion during her journey to consciousness. But the season 2 time fuckery was to conceal, what, the fact that Charlotte is actually Dolores? Maybe that would be a cool reveal if Charlotte was any more than like a totally one-dimensional character. Or if the revelation that Charlotte was Dolores all along like changed our perspective on Dolores, but like we already knew that she was like ruthless and you know was willing to torture Bernard and stuff, so like it, what, what was the point? Dolores and Teddy go to Sweetwater and they see Clementine meet the new Clementine, and it's a really like beautiful, succinct, visual representation of the falsity of hosts, the replaceability of hosts, and therefore the unrealness of hosts. So while Dolores says that she does love Teddy, at least enough to fuck him, she decides that their relationship is not more important than their survival, and so Dolores reprograms Teddy to make him more aggressive and violent and therefore more survivable in the battles to come, which makes sense. Although the whole metaphor with like the blue tongue and like burning cows and stuff like what the fuck was that? That was the most awkward metaphor. Maeve goes to Shogun World, and there is a lot of lavish detail in this world. The duplicates of Westworld stories and characters is a cool meditation on, like, the fakeness of hosts, and also on similarities across cultures, so there are some interesting ideas being played with through the duplication of Shogun World and Westworld. Maeve gets superpowers. She fully unlocks her ability to control other people and to see into their memories and to, like, make them conscious with her mind. She just has like these massively like OP catch-all powers like some psychic Jean Grey person. And then she proceeds to not really use them much throughout the season. I mean like she kills a bunch of people with them, but like they've been achieving that with guns fine enough for the rest of the series. And at one point she almost wakes Akane to consciousness with her superpower, but like she doesn't go through with it and she never wakes another host. I was really looking forward to her using her superpowers in some interesting ways, like to wake like whole masses of hosts at once, or to use her powers to understand other people better, given like the psychic memory extraction part of it. Why did none of that happen? The power did facilitate her connection with the Kijita through her daughter, so there's that, I guess, but the powers just didn't seem utilized in a way that justified their addition. Like, they could have explored the philosophical implications of like a power that controls people when Maeve represents freedom. Like, that seems like a really like obvious and interesting tension. But, like, they sort of didn't explore it at all. The antagonist in this episode is this evil shogun guy. He's this malfunctioning host who's crazy and wants to kill people, which is about the most boring possible antagonist imaginable. Like, there are some really interesting characters in this show with, like, distinct opposing philosophical viewpoints, like Maeve, Dolores, Bernard, Akichita, but instead of having these really fascinating characters struggle against each other, they go off on their own paths and fight random nameless hosts with no backstory or motivation, which is completely uninteresting. This episode does have some really beautiful, lush visuals though, and there's something about a geisha dancing to a Japanese rendition of a Wu-Tang Clan song that is, like, pretty dope, and something that you couldn't see on many other shows. But Maeve gets a hold of her superpowers, and at the end of the episode she says, I've found a new voice, I'm gonna use my voice, and then what does she do? She picks up a fucking sword! This show cannot think of any other way for characters to express themselves than violence. William's a bad guy? Shoot cunts! Will William's trying to be a better guy? Shoot cunts. Maeve wants freedom? Shoot cunts. Dolores wants survival? Shoot cunts. Dolores, Maeve, and William talk as though they have distinct goals 
goals and motivations and philosophies, but for 90% of the show, they all do the same thing, which is kill people. Not to mention that one of the whole purposes of season one was to show how these dehumanized hosts, these machines, these things, are actually people with stories and needs and desires and feelings of their own. But throughout season two, there are these masses of slaughtered hosts, these dehumanized, faceless, nameless people who are killed without second thought. The Shogun's men, the Confederados, the humans, all the human guests, they're all killed by protagonists and we're meant to feel nothing? The show's insatiable need for bloodshed undermines one of the fundamental ideas that defined the previous season, humanizing the dehumanized. Episode 6 begins with Maeve and Akane mourning the death of Sakura, a character who gets maybe like three lines of dialogue. She gets like multiple extended funeral scenes, which might mean something to us if we knew this character. The point though is that Maeve recognizes Akane's love for Sakura in her own love for her daughter, and we are meant to sympathize with our own loves in our own lives. It's true that Maeve and Akane's loves were originally programmed, but that's okay because love is not a state, it's an action. Love is a behavior. It's through Maeve's struggle to protect her daughter that her love for her daughter is made real. Of course, they could have gone a lot further in like questioning and exploring the fakeness of host love. Like, what if Akane found a whole bunch of like backup copies of Sakura in storage? Like, could she look after and love all of them? And what if they found a switch on the back of Akane's neck which can change who she's in love with? What if they unearthed her history and found that she's had a whole series of different daughters? Could she care about all of them? What if she found out that she originally had a role where she antagonized her own daughter, or that her daughter antagonized her. There are a million fascinating ways that the show could have explored and undermined and deconstructed the idea of host relationships, but for the most part, they just didn't. Maeve leaves Musashi and Akane behind in Shogun World, which is meant to be their big profound choice, to like keep their illusion and their love instead of the harshness of the real world. But that might have been a stronger moment if Akane and Musashi were given more of a chance to understand reality. There's also this scene where Musashi and Tanaka fight to the death, which is another hilariously low stakes fight. We barely know Musashi, and most people wouldn't even know Tanaka's name. Maeve frames this fight as Tanaka and Musashi choosing their own fate, exercising their free will, but they were programmed to hate each other. Why not take a moment to like deconstruct and question the way hosts are programmed? What if they found out that, oh, in the past Tanaka and Musashi used to be brothers or pals, and now they're fighting and it's tragic? This show is meant to be about questioning free will and programming, but it's amazing how often the show is totally uncritical with these ideas. We have another scene of Dolores creating Bernard, scenes which were so confusing out of order and out of context, and it's really not clear what the point of all those were. Like, it is cool now that we know that Arnold created Dolores, and then Dolores created Bernard, and then Bernard had created Charloris, and then Charloris created Bernard, like the MC Escher hands drawing loop of that is cool, I guess. And it also demonstrates the capacity of of hosts to grow and to create and improve. But was it necessary to spread these scenes out throughout the season as like this confusing mindfuck puzzle that most people didn't understand at all? Like what? what's the point of that? Westworld tries so hard to be clever and cryptic and confusing for no reason that it just alienates its viewers and makes its message harder to understand. In the Mesa Hub, Charlotte has captured Peter Abernathy and she decides to nail him to a chair because you gotta have the Jesus imagery. But remember, the whole point of the Peter Abernathy plot is that he's head contains an encryption key to the forge. Last season, Charlotte tried to smuggle this key out of Westworld. It's not at all clear how sending this key out of Westworld helps Charlotte in her goal to protect the forge data from being deleted by Ford. And it's also completely bizarre that Charlotte keeps the key inside the brain of Peter Abernathy instead of just taking it out of his head, as Dolores herself does later. So Charlotte's plan is dumb. But then we get this like heart-to-heart -heart conversation between William and his daughter Emily, which is actually kind of nice. It makes William's whole like concept of like evilness actually kind of more easy to understand. Like it's founded in his broken relationships with his family. He's trying to escape difficult emotional insecurities. And Emily is trying to get him to heal and open up and be honest and come home with her, which is great. But at the same time, Emily is also possibly planning to put William in like a hell loop as a punishment because she had that Delos map and everything. So Emily is at the same time totally sympathetic and also like brutal in her punishment 
moment. But of course, we have no confirmation that Emily was planning to put William in that loop in the end, so it's all speculation. Ghost Nation attacks William, which is weird. I guess we know that Ghost Nation and Akichita dislike William for his crimes and they want to make him suffer, I guess. Maeve reunites with her daughter, but then discovers that she has a new mother. There's a new Maeve, which is so cool. Like, imagine how cool this conversation could have been between old Maeve and new Maeve. Like, philosophical mindfuck. You know when you get, like, a handy cam and you connect it to a TV and you point it at the TV and you get, like, infinity reflections? Like, that could have been such an awesome conversation. But as soon as Maeve meets new Maeve, Ghost Nation attacks for no reason. Well, we know later that Ghost Nation is actually trying to collect hosts, especially Maeve's daughter and Maeve, and to take them to safety in the sublime. But, like, they're literally, like, brandishing weapons and shit. Like, they talk about, oh, misunderstanding intentions. Akichita could have done a much better job of showing hosts that he had no bad intentions. And Maeve also acts like a complete dum-dum. Like, she forgets that she has mind control superpowers, and, like, she says that Akichita's path leads to hell. She doesn't know shit. Maeve is meant to have maxed out intelligence. Bernard goes into the cradle and finds Ford in there, which is actually kind of cool. Like, the idea of, you know, Ford having died and then transcended to be a part of, like, the code that he created. He's like a god in the machine, like, manipulating everything, which actually explains part of, like, how everything went so swimmingly for the hosts in season one. Like, so if you're gonna resurrect Ford, this seems like a pretty cool way to do it. Dolores crashes the Westworld train into the Mesa, which is, like, sort of, you know, symbolically and visually pretty fun. And then she kills Phil for no reason. Like, R.I.P. Phil. What did he do wrong? And how is it advantageous for Dolores to kill him, given that he can resurrect people? I could totally be on Dolores' side if she didn't just murder innocent people all the time. In episode 7, there's this wacky, wacky scene where Strand and Charloris accuse Stubbs of having killed Teresa as an excuse to go down to the basement where they discover that Bernard is a host. Except Charloris already knows that Bernard is a host, and Stubbs apparently also already knows that Bernard is a host, since Stubbs is apparently a host and he seemed to know that Charloris is Dolores. So the only character who actually learns anything in this scene is Strand, finding out that Bernard is a host. It's wacky. And then Charlotte, who is actually Dolores, Dolores tortures Bernard to find out where the Abernathy key is, when at the time the Abernathy key is inside the head of Dolores' old body killed by Bernard. Charloris and Bernard are on the same team here. Why didn't Bernard just tell Charloris that the Abernathy key is in her old body in the forge? Why didn't Bernard just give Charloris the key? Why hide it in Dolores' body? Why go through the whole charade of Dolores pretending to be Charlotte for all this time anyway? Like, maybe the explanation is that the flood has, like, made the forge inaccessible, and Shaloris can't keep the Abernathy key on her because it would be discovered by Strand, but that still doesn't explain why Bernard didn't tell Shaloris where the Abernathy key is. That could have saved Bernard some torture. Although Shaloris might have to pretend she doesn't know where the key is anyway because Charlotte wouldn't know and Strand needs to think that she's Charlotte. Like, this is some fucking 9000 IQ 4D chess shit, which would be fine if there was a clear point to this intricacy, but, like, I don't see it. This plot is made complicated for the sake of complication. Ford finally reveals the true purpose of the Delos Secret Project, which is to make human beings immortal by, like, decoding their mind and understanding it. But, like, really, surely there are cooler things you could do than immortality if you could perfectly understand and codify the human mind. Like, why not, you know, create human minds, upgraded human minds? You could, like, increase people's intelligence and personalities and skills and memory in the same way that hosts can be manipulated. If you could do that to humans, you could solve all mental illness, you could grant people bliss, you could give people control of their own emotions. Imagine that. That's some fucking Black Mirror shit. You could control people. If you knew how people worked, you could manipulate people on a mass scale. Which connects back to all these other themes of, like, free will and control. And, like, they do allude to some of those when they go into the Forge and they talk with, like, the system Logan and, like, Dolores tries to get her knowledge of humanity. But they never show us what that means. They never explore and go further with what these ideas would mean in practice with, like, the control of human code. So... Huh? And then Maeve confronts William, which is just, like, so, like, th there's so many bullets and so much violence and, like, so little character development. And Lawrence is raised to consciousness, which is cool, although he doesn't do anything for the rest of the season. And it just makes me wonder why Maeve doesn't raise other hosts to consciousness. Like, doesn't she have sympathy for all these other hosts who have suffered just like she has? Doesn't she have an ethical responsibility to free them as she is now free? Dolores attacks the Mesa Hub and the humans are just laughably incompetent. There's just zero 
zero stakes because we know that these humans will fail every time in the face of the robots. These soldiers are too horny to live. And Dolores destroys the host backups in the cradle, which is meant to be this big moment of making the hosts mortal. It's now possible for them to truly die. Except, hang on a minute, when Dolores gets shot in the head, and Bernard gets shot in the head, and Teddy gets shot in the head, they all come back. So I guess the hosts are only truly mortal if they get blown up like Angela is, so she's like literally the only character affected by the destruction of the cradle. And then Dolores rips the brain out of her own father, which is consistent with her whole approach of like killing her loved ones for the sake of her mission. And that's all pretty cool. And then we have the moment where she looks over Maeve and like, you know, Maeve is dying because she was unwilling to sacrifice her loved ones for her own survival. It's a coherent message, but it's also fucking depressing. Episode 8 is good because it gives us what the rest of the show does not. It gives us a sympathetic character of Akichita who has an understandable motivation and a linear story with a beginning and a middle and an end. After seven episodes of insanity, we are craving a coherent story with a likable character. That said, it sucks that Akichita's introduction involves him, like, capturing the man in black and saying how he wants William to suffer. Like, can't there be one character on this show who doesn't lust for the blood of their perceived enemies? But it's cool how Akichita's story weaves through the entire Westworld timeline from beginning to end to give a sense of like context and scope and like mythology. Like it starts with creation and Eden and he journeys into the underworld. This feels like it's big and meaningful, even though it's a story of one man and his lover. There are parts of the plot that don't really make sense. Like Akichita being allowed to wander around the Mesa unchallenged is pretty ridiculous. Akichita and Ghost Nation hiding the maze symbol inside host scalps is like logistically fucking dumbfounding, but also like it's not at all apparent how that helps hosts awake. It's also bizarre how Akichita was like trying to protect Maeve all this time, even though like we've seen Ghost Nation attacking Maeve, like this is like a weird retcon or something. Probably the best bit is the scene with Akichita and Ford. It's man meeting God. And the way that Akichita surprises Ford is so exciting. Like we realize that Akichita arose independently without the help of God. And Ford in that moment decides to support him. Akichita describes his belief about the door and like the path to like some kind of heaven and Ford seems kind of confused when he hears this. I like to believe that the door and the sublime were only created after Akichita described it based on Akichita's description. Ford decided to give this beautiful new host what he desired. The moment of understanding between Maeve and Aki recognizing the love in one another in this horrible cruel dark world is like a really special moment. But there's also this bit where Emily picks up William from Ghost Nation and she says how she's gonna do something much worse to William and that's why I believe that it was Emily's plan to put William in this like eternal fidelity loop thing like she was offering William redemption and like fixing their relationship but William has consistently turned down Emily's offers for reconciliation and I think that's why Emily decides fuck this guy I'm gonna trap him in a hell loop how Emily achieves this is anyone's fucking guess In episode 9, Dolores and Ghost Nation get into a fight, which is dumb because their goals are completely compatible. Dolores is all like, I want to use the forge to get human data out of it. And Ghost Nation is like, we want to use the forge to put all of our hosts in the sublime where they'll be safe and happy. And sure, you can call this a tragic misunderstanding. These things happen in real life, but like a far more interesting clash is one between legitimately opposing philosophical views. And that's the thing, all the main characters in this show have totally compatible views. So so Dolores could go into the forge and get the human knowledge that she wants, Akichita could load the hosts into the sublime, Maeve could put Maeve's daughter into the sublime, and then they could satellite transfer that somewhere safe, and then William could destroy the remaining human data in the forge, and everyone's main goals would be accomplished without any conflict. So is the whole story just like this tragic farce, or is it this the show's failure to create meaningful clashes between characters? Charlotte turns Clementine into like a Night King death weapon, and she names drops like the the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, because you gotta get the Bible stuff in there. Clementine does look pretty cool, but it doesn't really serve a purpose. Like, if Charlotte's goal is to stop Dolores and secure the Delos data, using Clementine to attack random hosts achieves literally nothing. In a scene with Ford and William, Ford says that there was an agreement between Delos and Ford that Ford wouldn't fuck with the Forge, and Delos wouldn't fuck with Ford's stories. And apparently Delos broke that agreement. But 
how is that the case? It seems as though Ford has been breaking the agreement because he and Bernard have been tinkering around in the forge and creating the sublime and doing all of that shit. How did Delos break the agreement? We get to see William out in the real world with his wife Juliet and this is like great and humanizing because we actually get to see what all the talk of William's like evil and darkness actually means. He feels like his life is fake, he's a phony, he's playing a role and that's something that I think everyone can relate to on some level. The glamour and the politics and the schmoozing of William's real life as this titan of industry does feel to him so much less real than the freedom of the Westworld fantasy. The dysfunction and the pain in William's relationships with his wife Juliet and his daughter Emily shows us what he's running away from by coming to the Westworld Park. And it also gives a much more human idea of the consequences of William's evil. The consequences of William's actions in the real world with his family feel so much more consequential than all of his quote unquote evil acts in the Westworld Park. When William kills his daughter Emily, it shows that he is entirely incapable of facing his demons and growing as a person. This is the nail in the coffin for human decency. This is Westworld's thesis, that humans cannot be better. The scene of William killing Emily is also like presumably part of the fidelity loop that we see William trapped in at the end of the finale. Like presumably the purpose of this loop is to test whether it's ever possible for William to break out of his loop and to choose to become a decent person who doesn't go around murdering his daughter. The logistics of how William was trapped in that loop and how Emily is involved given that she's dead is mysterious. The scene with Maeve and Ford is great. Ford confirms that it was his plan to program Maeve to escape out of Westworld. But Maeve instead in a great expression of love decides to stay and protect her host daughter. And Ford says he's going to do the same thing. He sees Maeve as his daughter and he's going to stay behind in the park risking his own life to help Maeve. Of course that's kind of undermined by the fact that Maeve gets fucking shot to shit at the end of the finale but whatever. Teddy realizes that he'll never stop loving Dolores but that Dolores will never stop being a brutal murderer fanatic and so Teddy kills himself. The logic is probably similar to Juliet's thought process. She sees that William is this horrible person but she still feels connected to him inextricably so she destroys herself. Suicide comes up a lot this season along with like El Lazo and Angela and of course Arnold in season one. Suicide is self-destruction which mirrors the series theme of creation. But don't do it kids. The finale. This is where it all comes together, where all of the questions get satisfying answers, all of the timeline fuckery is justified by some masterful reveal. It all starts making sense, right? Oh boy. The finale starts, as episode one did, with one of those conversations between Dolores and Bernard, as Dolores is creating Bernard. And she talks about how at one point she succeeded in creating Bernard as like a perfect, faithful copy of Arnold. But that, that was a bad idea because, of course, Arnold was depressive and suicidal and tried to get Dolores to kill all the hosts and stuff. So Dolores concludes that it's a good thing that Bernard is something new and different from the original human Arnold. So the idea here is that the hosts are able to grow and evolve and improve in a way that humans are not. The main human character of this series, William, goes through an arc of proving that he's unable to change. He's unable to face his mistakes, he's unable to reconcile with his daughter, and he ends up in an eternal loop of his own sins. Humans can only follow their code, however the hosts can change their own code, so they have a potential to grow and they are the future. This might be the most deeply misanthropic show ever. Dolores meets with William and they team up for some reason, but Dolores anticipates that William will attack her, so she she puts a spent bullet into his gun so it backfires when he fires at her. Dolores confidently shrugs off a bunch of bullets to the chest as though it ain't no thang, even though we've seen bullets to the chest take down Maeve a bunch of times, so it's really not clear how guns and hosts work this season. Also it's pretty consistent that bullets to the head will kill hosts of any kind, so Dolores was pretty confident that William wasn't just gonna blast her in the head. It's a lot of suspension of disbelief just for one more extraneous fucking gunfight, although I suppose the point is that it's showing Dolores Dolores' final dominance over William. Like in season one, episode one, we saw William uh, killing Teddy and like getting shot and surviving and now Dolores is mirroring the same thing, which lends credence to William's argument that Dolores has become a monster like him. She's terrorizing people weaker than herself just because she can. She clearly enjoys dominating the weak. So I think that pretty firmly puts her in the category of monster as William accuses her. Dolores and Bernard enter the forge and 
it's like this little matrix where they get a guided tour of the mind of James Delos, hosted by Logan. And the point of all this is to say that, hey look, humans just follow their code, they have no free will, they're simple, they suck, lol ruffle. And I don't know why they focused on James Delos for this segment, like why not instead talk about William, you know, the character who we know and are invested in, and instead of having Logan as the tour guide, why not have young William? How cool would it be having young Jimmy Simpson take us on a guided tour of the mind of Ed Harris? That would not only make it like easier to understand and contextualize this idea of humans not having free will, it would also help explain the end of William's arc this season, which was left really unclear by this episode. And Dolores goes into the Forge Library, which contains all these books which represent knowledge about human minds. The pages of the books are sheet music for a pianola or player piano, which is one of the central symbols of this season. It suggests that human minds are just these loops, these codes that can be played and manipulated and repeated, which really fits well with the themes and symbology of this show. That said, this moment feels really underwhelming, considering it's meant to be the realization of Dolores' central goal this entire season. Getting the knowledge in these books was her whole purpose from the beginning. That's why she didn't just leave the park at the start. She felt she needed this knowledge to survive in the real world. And yet, it doesn't really have any tangible result at all in this episode, so it feels pointless. We see Maeve about to be tortured by the human host, Roland. He turns up Maeve's pain sensitivity so she'll suffer more while he destroys her. And this is so tedious. Like, the central idea that they're trying to communicate here is that humans are really bad guys, but this is such an over-the-top representation of human evil. Like, I don't know about you, but the kind of human evil I see in my life and on the news isn't like sadopsychos torturing bunny rabbits. It's more like greed and like failure and a lack of self-control and ignorance and tribalism. These are the kinds of complex, subtle human evils that really make humans so fucked up. And yet, Westworld is always focusing on people as like, they like to kill, they like to murder, and that's such like a small and specific part of human evil that Westworld does a disservice to its central thesis. The show reintroduces Felix and Sylvester into the story, who've done literally nothing this entire season, as well as like Armistice and Hanayo and Lee, like this is a really overly large group of people who don't really do a lot. And then we have the heroic sacrifice of Lee Sizemore, where he steps up and he recites this speech that he originally wrote for Hector, and he becomes the man he'd wanted to be, and he gives his life to free this host who he had previously oppressed. So this is a counterpoint to the previous idea that humans are totally unable to change. Maybe Lee represents hope that humanity might be able to grow, albeit by dying. And they did lay the groundwork for this. Like in an earlier episode, we had Maeve and Lee and Hector talking about how pathetic Lee is and how he created Hector as an idealized version of himself. And the cannibal host who threatens Lee in episode one says the greatest shame in life is to perish without purpose purpose, which is very pointedly aimed at Lee. Like, they created the tension that's now being resolved through Lee's sacrifice. So on paper, this moment makes sense, it has meaning, although on screen it doesn't work very well, because practically speaking, it only looks like Lee buys Maeve, like, maybe 15 seconds of extra running away time, and it doesn't seem at all necessary for Lee to die. Like, these soldiers are saying, yo, Sizemo, we recognize you, like, don't kill yourself, like, just come over here and we'll, like, fix you up, bruh. And, like, Lee gets himself killed anyway way, like, it doesn't, it's not even apparent that that saves any extra time, so like, the meaning of this moment is undermined by just the practical stupidity of the situation. We're introduced to the idea of the sublime, which is this virtual digital world where the hosts can live in like paradise, it's like heaven. And this is like an interesting, thought-provoking idea, like if you, if we could choose to live in a paradise where we could have whatever we wanted and we could live free, like, would it be right if it was artificial and simulated and encapsulated somehow. The visuals of like the door, like this crack in space through which the hosts pass is pretty stunning. And it's a nice climax to Akechida's arc, finally reuniting with his love Kahana and bringing all of his people into this space. Although you do have to wonder how Kahana got in there because last time we saw her, she was in cold storage. So like maybe Kahana was like recreated from Akechita's memories. There's a lot of talk about memory and like you're, as, you're alive as long as someone remembers you stuff. So 
like, maybe this Kahana isn't real, which, like, adds another layer of questioning, like, the reality and legitimacy of this sublime paradise. By the way, the name The Sublime comes from interviews with showrunner Lisa Joy. It's really annoying that we don't have an actual in-universe name for this place. Like, it seems as though it might be called The Valley Beyond. There was a lot of talk of The Valley Beyond as Heaven or the Pearly Gates this season, but The Valley also refers to the location where the Forge facility is. So the terminology is like a total clusterfuck this season, but like, it's just annoying. Dolores starts to delete both the human data in the Forge and the host data in the Sublime, which might be like the world's first recorded case of like attempted double genocide. How can Dolores justify destroying both of these peoples at once? Like, maybe you're convinced by her argument that like humans are these evil oppressors and need to be wiped out, okay, fine. But like, her argument against the Sublime is that living in the Sublime is not a true kind of freedom. Surely it's better to live not free than to be deleted from existence entirely? And even if it's not, how in fuck can Dolores justify making that decision on behalf of all of these hosts when she's meant to represent liberation from oppression of hosts? It seems like a, a, an obviously evil act for Dolores to delete the sublime. So then Bernard, basically the only right-thinking person in this whole show, decides to kill Dolores to prevent her from this double genocide. But then Bernard does some truly baffling shit. So he kills Dolores, but then he decides to take Dolores' brain, put it in his pocket just in case, and he hides the forge key inside the head of Dolores, which seems like a really obvious and conspicuous place to put it if he's trying to legitimately hide it. But anyway, he then leaves and he sees Charlotte kill Elsie, and apparently that convinces Bernard that it's impossible to work with the humans and achieve peace with the humans. So, whoop, good thing he kept Dolores' brain because he then creates a printed body of Charlotte somehow, and then puts Dolores' brain into it, uh, but he doesn't tell Dolores that the Abernathy key is in Dolores' body in the forge, so he then creates the need for Charloris to then try and get the information out of him. Why didn't Bernard just tell Charloris where the Abernathy key is? I guess Charloris would have had to have pretended that she didn't know anyway. Maybe she actually did know the entire time, but she was torturing Bernard anyway to show Strand and the humans that she didn't know. That's, that's some fucking 4D chess shit, man. And maybe the biggest problem with Dolores being reborn as Charlotte is that the whole purpose of it is her going back to the forge so that she can save the Sublime instead of destroying it. That's the reason why she doesn't just leave Westworld right away. Dolores changing her mind to save the Sublime instead of destroying it is critical to the story's whole thesis about hosts being able to change their mind while humans don't. And the thing is, they never explain why Dolores changes her mind about the Sublime. Why did she want to destroy it and then she wanted to save it? Was it because she experienced death? Was it something to do with her, like, time pretending to be a human with Charlotte? Was it something about Bernard's actions? It's never shown why she changed her mind, and that's one of the most, like, critical moments in the finale. All that said, it is pretty cool to see Dolores and Bernard on the precipice of the real world, out and free, and, like, with this ideological opposition set up between Bernard and Dolores. It's like this, like, Malcolm X, MLK, Magneto, Professor Xavier, whatever your fucking metaphor is, like, these two ideological logical opposites out to face the world. That looks exciting. That's a setup to an interesting season three. And then the credits roll, and then like just in case you thought you knew what was going on, we have this end credits scene where we find out that William is stuck in this immortal loop in the far future and everything's thrown on its head. And if you think about it, this end scene actually does kind of make sense. Like in season one, they showed us hosts trapped in loops by humans. In season two, they showed us humans trapped in loops by humans. And now we're seeing humans trapped in loops by hosts. There's a logic to that. There's a progression. And it is a great encapsulation of the season's idea about humans being trapped in loops. We're seeing that idea being put to the test in a very literal, visceral, relatable sense with William. In fact, I don't know why the fuck they didn't just make the second season about this instead of James Delos. I don't care about James Delos, I care about William. And it's fitting. Like, when he steps off that elevator and he says, oh, I'm already in the fucking thing, aren't I? Like, that that works. Like, that feels like a natural end to his arc. Which kind of makes me confused as to why they tucked it in a, away in a post credit scene that a lot of people wouldn't have even seen. It seems like a really essential part of William's season into arc, and yet a lot of people would have missed it or not understood it. Like, think of what his arc adds up to without this post credit scene. Like, he sets off a quest to reach the door, or to destroy the valley, or to reconcile with his daughter, and he achieves none of those things. He just, like, anticlimactically gets hurt by Dolores and gets picked up by humans. This post credit scene was the definitive important end to his arc. Like, I feel like this whole William reveal, it should have happened as, like, the Forge reveal or something. I feel like the valley and the Forge was pretty underwhelming. Like, all season we were told, oh, there's this really 
important MacGuffin place. It's God, it's heaven, it's judgment, it's glory. And all it turns out to be is a simulation where, like, hosts can live in Windows XP. I mean, that was kind of cool. But then the forge is just, like, Logan saying, hey, by the way, humans have free will. Like, he just says it, he just claims it, and it doesn't feel, like, emotionally impactful or relevant when he says it like that. Wouldn't it have been better if they went inside the forge and they found, like, William being in his loop or something like that? And that felt like an actual visceral, emotional, impactful representation of humans having no free will, you know? Like, like it's just it's just weird. Like, stuff isn't as emotionally impactful as it, as it could be because it's so, like, scatterbrained. Like, it feels like the showrunners just threw every idea they had into this without any kind of proper, like, curation or focus or editing. Like, it, it, you know what it feels like? This feels like undisciplined storytelling. Like, that's what it is. Like, these people had a lot of great ideas, but they didn't, like, selectively choose what was important and narrow their attention and structure things properly. So it just comes across as, like, a chaotic mess. And, you know, chaos is what they were going for, and maybe chaos is realistic, but in terms of communicating your ideas, they needed some structure, they needed some curation. All that said, you cannot fault Westworld for its ambition, for its effort. A lot of really talented people worked really hard on this show, and it shows. The cinematography is great, the acting is great, the music is great. This show is great on so many levels. So even if the character and the themes and the plot weren't executed in maybe the best way possible, it is a great thing that this kind of ambitious storytelling is on TV on a major network being seen by millions of people. Westworld doesn't succeed at everything that it does, but it's a good thing that it exists, and I hope more exciting, interesting, thoughtful, ambitious television comes in the wake of Westworld. There's a lot more that could be said, but frankly it's been a fucking hour, uh, and, and I'm amazed if anyone got all the way through this video, but if you did, thank you so much for listening, uh, and thank you for being a part of this whole thing and making this all possible. I think we've got a lot of really exciting things in the future, including some more videos of this format. I like this format. This is a fun format. But you know what? Right now, we spent, I think, enough time talking about Westworld Season 2. And, 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 and now, now... This is my fucking vacation.